Barbara, this is drama before even, you know, trying to add people. We're losing people. What's your reaction to what happened with juror number two? Yes, you know, two steps forward, one step back. It, it, it seemed like things were progressing very quickly, um, but this is very concerning. You know, as the judge said, there's a reason this is an anonymous jury. There is a desire to protect this jury from threats, intimidation, or even coercion by outside forces. But there has been so much detail reported about these jurors that it's probably not hard to figure out if you know something about them. They've been asked not only where they live, but they've been asked, who is your current employer and who was your previous employer? You know, if you work with a colleague, you say, well, that sounds a lot like Sheila. Hey, Sheila, is this you? And so um, I think one of the things that the judge has said that perhaps they ought to do is to not make public the place of employment or prior employment, instead just asking what is it you do for a living. That would be sufficient for these, jur for these lawyers to decide whether this is an appropriate juror without providing publicly a lot more detail. I also think the court has been admonishing the media to not provide physical descriptions that this is a you know, six-foot male with uh, blonde hair so that people can start putting two and two together. There is a goal to protect their identity, and it is to protect not only their safety, but the integrity of this process. And Kush, you had actually expressed concern about this very thing. You said there was a risk of jurors' identities being revealed. Are we seeing that play out? And what do you think should be the best answer here? Yeah, no, we are seeing it play out, unfortunately. Um, I think that this was frankly inevitable, um, given the amount of information that was uh, coming out. This is not the fault of the media. Um, it's the fault of the judge and the district attorney's office for not managing this process more intelligently. And evidently, you know, they're working through it today and they're going to, you know, uh, impose some constraints uh, around the process. But um, this is highly unfortunate and I'm a little worried that it's not going to stop. Um, and um, we're just going to have to t take it one day at a time. There's obviously a fine line about how much information can be revealed when you want to keep identities secret and yet want to be as transparent as possible about the process and who the people are who will be deciding the fate of such a consequential case. Harry, does this now give Trump more ammunition about the jury selection process, do you think? It gives everyone more ammunition, but the biggest problem is it opens up a whole new avenue of problems for Merchan and the proceedings. So we've been worried about witness identities and whether they might be cowed. This, there, this, it's as if there's a st stadium full of Klieg lights on every possible detail about the jurors. You've had probably juror consultants sort of fan out to the neighborhoods and find out about them. You know, we're 24 hours uh, or 48 hours since, and, and one or two identities maybe are already known. I, I really agree with Ankush. This is not going to uh, stop until and unless Judge Merchan imposes different uh, kinds of ground rules. And it's really troubling. It's Yes, she thought she couldn't be impartial, but the real problem is all the pressure that uh, came on her because people knew her identity. That, that, over the course of a trial, could have all kinds of consequences. And if somebody has to be dismissed in the middle of a case, that's, that really gets to be problematic. Barbara, how do you see it in terms of where this process goes now, given we have six more jurors to be seated, six more alternates, a total of 12 altogether, that still have to be found and, and brought to this panel? So, I mean, are we going to start talking about sequestering the jury now? What do you think? Well, I think that um, what the judge and the parties need to do is to fine-tune the questions that they're asking the jurors to answer in public, uh, because revealing things like not only the community where they live, uh, but where they work, um, and where they worked previously, there's enough information out there from which members of the public can reasonably conclude who these people are. And so I think they're going to have to start asking these questions in more generic terms, um, and th they'll have to hammer that out today. So it may be that we take a break, that uh, instead of jumping right into the process where we left off on Tuesday, it may be that they need to tighten up these questions so that there's less public information revealed about these people. And it can be done. Um, you know, asking more about the nature of the work than the identity of the employer is probably all that they need to be able to assess this person's suitability for this case. Vaughn, we're also expecting some action potentially before jury selection resumes. 
related to Trump's social media posts. What can you tell us about this? Right. Folks will recall that earlier this week that the district attorney's office went to Judge Marshawn asking him to charge Trump for having violated the gag order that was placed on him for not attacking witnesses or potential witnesses. And you'll recall that Judge Marshawn placed a hearing for this upcoming Tuesday morning at 9.30 a.m. But just here in the last few minutes, the district attorney's prosecutors have come back to Judge Marshawn here and, uh, uh, and asserted that he has violated the gag order an additional seven times. The most prominent one, they said the most concerning one, was a post last night in which Donald Trump quoted Fox personality Jesse Waters. And that quote was, they are catching undercover liberal activists lying to the judge in order to get on the Trump jury. Now, the gag order directly stipulates that there is not to be any public statements about any prospective juror or any juror in this criminal proceeding. And so, at this point in time, Judge Marshawn has not declared whether Donald Trump has actually violated the gag order or not, whether that post specifically is intimidation of a potential juror or jurors. But at this point in time, the district attorney's case is at least challenging on cause that Donald Trump continues, despite warning from the court continues to violate the gag order that they say is imperative to being able to uh, uh, prosecute this case fairly in front of a jury that is not tainted. Harry, that post that Vaughn just mentioned that Trump put on social media quoting a Fox News anchor calling some of these potential jurors liberal activists, do you see repercussions for Trump for that? There ought to be, although it might have to do with amending the gag order going forward, but it's part and parcel on what we were just talking about. It's not just the media is all over this and uh, the, the, the focus from neighborhoods. Trump himself is at best mischievous and, and at worst motivated to kind of break the rules. The chaos, he was the chaos president. He is now the chaos defendant. And this is just the first thing that happens this week. If we have a series of stumbles and um, problems of this nature, the whole trial becomes in Cumbered with doubts about public credibility, mm. and that serves Trump's purposes and disserves the DA's purposes. It's a huge general problem that we're seeing the first instance of. Barbara, just the fact that Trump keeps sort of walking up to the line, testing the limits of this gag order, do you think he is trying to put the judge in a precarious position here? Just how difficult will it be for the judge to make a decision on how hard to come down on him? Yeah, I think Donald Trump is, uh, you know, holds the cards here. He knows that the judge will be very reluctant to impose sanctions. The judge doesn't want to do anything that not only uh, affects due process rights here, but creates the impression of some unfairness in the case. And so I think Donald Trump will keep pushing the buttons. Ultimately, I think the judge needs to take a firm stand, and he should do that today. Um, he can do that by holding Donald Trump in contempt of his order. Uh, you know, there's a process for criminal contempt, but that requires separate proceedings. He can use civil contempt for uh, to, to deter him from engaging in this kind of uh, behavior in the future. He can do that by imposing a fine, and he also has the power to jail Donald Trump. It gets very complicated with Secret Service details, but you know, it can be worked out. And I think the judge ought to take a firm stand. It's the only way to nip it, and he needs to nip it in the bud. Angus, two of the current jurors who've been selected so far are lawyers. How common is that? And, and how might a, a lawyer look at the case differently than, say, your average Joe? Yeah, it's actually it's very uncommon um, because actually parties tend to try to strike jurors, uh, who, prospective jurors who are lawyers, because the sort of the conventional wisdom is that if you put a jury, uh, if you put a lawyer on the jury, they'll sort of dominate the uh, the deliberations and, and sort of control the outcome that way. In this particular case, um, it may be that uh, both the DA's office and Trump, uh, Trump's lawyers, uh, see some potential upside to having some lawyers uh, in the jury room in this case. Right, there's going to be some fairly technical elements of the case that it would be helpful to both sides, conceivably, either the DA's office uh, or the defense, to kind of have a, a lawyer who's in the jury uh, deliberations, too, evidently, who might be able to sort of uh, 
help the jurors through the process of like navigating some of this because you know the nature of this case we call it a sort of hush money case for shorthand but it's a falsifying business records case and there are technical elements of this that will be a little tricky for jurors they will figure it out of course uh, but that may be what's going on here yeah, falsifying business records to cover up a second crime, which makes the initial falsifying records go from a misdemeanor to a felony charge. You're right. It could be complicated legally. Thank you so much all for joining this conversation. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.